Hello, uh, let's see, it's 6, 14 of 2023. I guess it's more important what time it is. It's 5 o'clock p.m. And I have not taken any of my morning meds at all. And I know one of these is a diabetic pill, to take morning and night. I don't know what this one is. And here's the water pill that makes me piss, which is really inconvenient. And I don't know what the rest of these are. Well, these are two small ones. You do realize that it's almost 6 p.m. and I'm taking my morning pills. I think this is the only capsule I take. I should know what it is. I don't. I'll just wait a little bit here. My night pills, I know one of them is the uh, uh, I don't know. There's three pills all together. But I'm still working on the day ones. I mentioned that I was um, yesterday going to, you can see it right back here on this, no you can't, too far away I guess, but uh, my Chrome tablet, that I was going to hook it up over here. Dee Dee, just push the door open Dee Dee. She's out there crying our cat. You may be able to hear her, I don't hear it right now, I did, no I do. My uh, son's in his room, and I think he's got his door closed, but he's playing trance music or whatever else it's called. I actually I like that kind of music a lot. That's that's what I like. And uh, I, I rub my eyes too much. I don't know why. I think maybe they get dry. I don't know. Um... I um, think I was mistaken. I think some of the videos in the last few days or last week, I think I was saying that I had a doctor's appointment this month. Let's see, January, February, March, April, May, June. Yeah, it's, it's uh, June 14th. Uh, actually, my appointment's late in July, July 21st. I'm going to have to get in before that, but I got so much stuff going on, and uh, I don't think I'm going to try to go to my doctor's office, you know, this month, but I'll try to get after the 17th or the 1st of July, I'll try to try to get in. Um, I think I put too much junk on this board here. Whiteboard, I have two of them. And one is over here, in, actually in front, on the wall there. And that's the one that's this, except larger. And this is what we sent, the United States sent into space with a record and directions for the aliens to <laughs> how to get here and uh, everything so it's really neat I mean I think they sent I think there might have been a gold thing that they sent I'm not sure well wait a minute the Pioneer 10 spacecraft destined to be the first man-made object to escape our solar system 
carries this plaque. It is designed to show uh, where was I? Scientifically educated inhabitants of other solar star systems who might intercept it millions of years from now when Pioneer uh, might intercept it see I think I'm repeating this millions of years from now when Pioneer was launched from where and by what kind of beings the design is engraved into a gold anodized I think that's the wrong pronunciation aluminum plate 152 by 229 millimeters 6 inches by 9 inches attached to the spacecraft's antenna support struts in a position to help shield it from erosion by interstellar dust. At the far right, the bracketing bars, number one, show the height and the weight, the height of women compared, the height of the woman compared to the spacecraft. Figure number two represented it, represented a reverse in the direction of spin of the electrons in a hydrogen atom. This transition puts out a characteristic radio wave of 21 centimeters long, so we are indicating that 21 centimeters is our base length. The horizontal and vertical ticks three uh, are a representation of the number eight in binary form. Therefore, the woman is eight by 21 centimeters. One equals 168 centimeters, or about five foot five inches tall. The human figure represents the type of creatures that created Pioneer. The man's hand is raised in a gesture of goodwill. Of course, probably when it reaches the aliens, that will be a, a sign of, of war or something. You know. The radio plat pattern four will help other scientists locate our solar system in the galaxy. This solid, so they're giving aliens the directions on how to arrive here. I wonder if they're going to tell them, you know, what weapons we have, or we come in peace, or don't come near us, or we, I don't know. The, uh, but I don't think I have to worry. I'm 82 years of age. The solid bar indicates distance with the horizontal TAL bar five denoting the distance from the sun to the galaxy's center. The shorter solid bar represents directions and distances to various pulsars from our sun, and the ticks following them are the periods of the pulsars in binary form. Pulsars are known to be shown showing down and if the rate of slowing is constant, uh, the other world scientists should be able to roughly deduce the time Pioneer was launched. Thus, we have placed ourselves approximately in both space and time. The drawing at the bottom, the six, indicates our solar system. The ticks accompanying each planet the relative distance in binary form of the planet to the sun. Pioneer's trajectory is shown as starting from the third planet, Earth. And there it is. For sale by the Superintendent of Documents, U.S. Government Printing Office, Washington, D.C., 20422. When I was a kid and growing up, I used to purchase a lot of uh, publications from the government printing office.
and this is the first time in years and years and years that I've heard of the government printing office. I bought uh, a lot of uh, military manuals, uh, Arctic survival, uh, tropical survival, and all types of things like that, and a lot of other stuff. Funny, when I was in high school, I never opened my, well, in the beginning, when I first got my textbooks, for the beginning of the year, I'd flip through and if I saw anything interesting in it, then I would read it, you know, and then after that I never opened the books. <laughs> of course, I went to summer school four years in a row. wonder why I went to summer school, I wonder. Even when it was graduation time, you know, I graduated, but I had to go to summer school after the graduation. And of course, I didn't go to. I could go to the graduation, uh, but everybody got their diploma, you know, in a envelope or whatever. I I think I got a. Well, I didn't go. <laughs> so uh, I didn't go. I got a blank piece of paper or something, you know. So uh, do you feel sorry for me? I feel sorry for me. Um, let's check and see what um, what the site looks like. What site? I'm not sure. Um, okay, let's see what CNN looks like. Well, let's see what my YouTube site looks like. I'm running Windows 11 Pro, by the way, on this on this computer, and there again, everything takes so long to. It must be because of you know that this video is being created and recorded or something. Let's see, Trump gets a devastation, devastating order from another federal court. Yeah, you know, I can't believe the things that he is, well I can, but I mean, <laughs> I can't believe the things he says, but, uh, you know, one of these, he has more crimes that he's committed that he that are coming up, and one of these courts may just order him to uh, not make the threats and things that he's doing, and 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 they can uh, with the you know I think he's being charged like right now or with thirty five felonies or something. Uh, a court can order the person. Uh, you know, not to do things because they could they could just put him in hold him in prison until the trial. Or they could put a, you know, a tracking device on his leg. They could take his passport away. They could they can do the court can do. He's already been charged with thirty five I think it is thirty five felonies. So he's he's just devastatingly stupid and arrogant and he's of course letting him be unhampered 
it just plays into, because every day he's saying things that he should not be saying. If you are, you know, charged with a crime, you know, so don't be making threats against, you know, judges and the government and everything else. So, I mean, it's taking a long time to load. Anyway, it says uh, Trump. I'm Ben Micellis from the Midas Touch Network. Let's see if they put anything below where I can just read it. My son is playing. Uh, okay, folks, the hits just keep coming in at the same. I hope that I don't get it. <sighs> Same time Donald Trump was being arraigned on the 38 count federal criminal indictment voted upon by the grand jury in. I hope I don't get a copyright hit because of the music in the background that my son's playing. I like trans music. It's also called, I th there's like three names, I think, because they all sound the same to me when you know the music. Uh, and I, there's trans and a couple others, so I, I like them all myself. So far I haven't got a copyright hit, and a couple of you have mentioned that you can hear, you know. By the way, uh, I think this is the first time I've run into this in uh, our uh, fuse box. It's in the Laund or the yeah the laundry room, and several years ago or whatever there was something weird about it, uh, and I uh, put a work order in to the you know the office here, and they had a maintenance guy come out real nice come out, and he looked at it. And he didn't really do anything. I, I'm not sure what he told me. can't remember now what he told me. That's quite a few years ago. Well, recently we had a couple temporary, you know, power outages from the fuse box. So I think it was a partial. And it was the living room. And in the living room is just a disaster area. We put stuff in there. It's... But in the living room, on the wall over there, is where the uh, internet comes in. And that's where, you know, uh, I've got the cables and stuff, you know. So, uh, we had a couple, I think, I think one of them are, if the, the problem is, you know, you have sometimes one thing going on, and then you have another thing that interrupts. I mean, you know, that, uh, but, uh, so we lost power, uh, recently. And, of course, when we lose power, we lose the internet. Then we lost the internet for a little bit. And, uh, so what was the turning point? Well, too, the fuse box here is weird. You know, I'm, I'm not really familiar with, I mean, I know fuse boxes, and I know you got, you know, here in the United States, you got, you know, what, 120 volts, and then the 220 or something for your uh, dryer. And then, of course, there are these. And so, and the, you know, when you open the thing, the thing it, it lists the numbers and then on a card or whatever it tells you if you flip this one it turns off the power to that area and stuff like that so um, had some uh, well I guess I should go back to give up on this guy Go back to this. Go back to this cute guy. So um, 
in the past I had some trouble and the maintenance guy came out and I, he didn't really do anything. I mean, because none of, none of the things, sh sh you know, flipped. Because in my, that's my experience is, you know, you open up the thing and then the, these things that are in there, like cartridges or whatever, and there'll be a thing that flipped over. And then you know that's where the problem was. And uh, none of it had flipped over. So anyway, we had some trouble in the last two or three days when we, and we weren't sure, okay, did we lose electrical power because of a storm or whatever. And uh, so anyway, I, I've made out a work order and it came out today. And first time I've seen a, you know, fuse box with the outer thing actually, you know, pulled off and then you could see the wiring and that kind of stuff in there. And uh, the guy said, oh, wow. He says, yeah, this, this one's, you know, it's gone, it's a goner. And so he left and he could leave the power going for here. And uh, except, I guess, for whatever one he pulled out. I think it was, anyway, he leaves to get, you know, to get a replacement for that. And uh, then I'm in, and Darlene's bed is in the dining room. And she has a view of the, you know, the kitchen and the laundry room. And, uh, so while I was there talking to her about stuff, uh, she saw the fuse panel sparking going on in there, sparking going on in there. I, I couldn't see it. And, but anyway, I called the office so they could call, you know, because he was rounding this stuff and I thought he might just decide to do something else, you know, for a little bit. But if it's sparking, you know, it's not good. So, uh, I called the office and and then they called him and then he came right away and uh, I well she said actually I, I told her don't don't say I can't that I couldn't see it you know because you saw it and uh, uh, in case you know and he, he came in and he said he could see it he said oh yeah he says okay that's two more that just you know destroyed himself. He says, I have to go get two more of those. So he went and came back in a few minutes and he put the thing back together. So I guess we're okay. Uh, you know, I know a little bit about electricity, but I don't really know. Uh, you know, that's the first, I guess, time for time. Well, of course, I I worked security, so for 30 years. And so, yeah, I, when I made my rounds at different places, you know, yeah, I would see construction going on and stuff like that. So I guess I did see, you know, panels that weren't, weren't complete and that kind of stuff. At one hospital that I worked at, I was a supervisor and I was in charge of the uh, testing of the fire alarm system and other, other stuff. And then the director of security this place, uh, this construction that was being done was, uh, <clears throat> I think, 15 or 20 million dollars worth or something because it was a parking garage. I forget exactly how much it was. It was millions. A parking garage and then underneath was uh, uh, receiving, the receiving department was underneath there, you know, with a their own little parking lot where they could pull in underneath the uh, concrete and whatever and that kind of stuff. And there was some other stuff there. But anyway, the director of security was laid up for weeks with a bad leg. And uh, so I was temporarily in charge. And uh, I got called to the administrator's office. That's the first time I'd actually been well, I probably made some rounds maybe into the administrator's office, but that was the first time I was called, with, you know, there. And then he wanted me to talk to the contractor because the papers had to be signed, you know, the, the thing sort of like that area, the parking garage and the, that's, that, that's still in the hands of the contractor until 
you know, in this case, the hospital signs off, then they can get their money and that type of stuff. And uh, also, there were, at that hospital, there were three of us there. The hospital administrator, the lieutenant, and myself. We were the only ones who were signed off for making of keys. And that was a, like a full-time job. And, uh, you know, they, and they had high, I forget what they're called now, I think it started with M, very high security keys that only a very, and like in Kansas City, only that place could supposedly make those keys. And uh, they had a contract or something. And, and they were cut, you know, in a pretty unique way. But they were a very good, Kenton Brothers was the name of the company. And, uh, uh, and we, we did all our, you know, locks and keys and that kind of stuff through them. So anyway, this, the people who built this um, thing for us, we were ready to take possession of it. But there was almost no keys. And some of the doors were, you know, gigantic doors so trucks could drive through them, you know, and that kind of stuff. And that for some of them there was no key, you know, to, to turn over to us, to security. And uh, and others are where you would need multiple keys, you know, there was just two or something like that. And so I got called to the hospital administrator and he explained to me what the problem was. Well, I knew the problem was about keys. I mean, I knew a problem because I made rounds and and I one, they can, the workers were leaving these keys, all the keys just stuck in the you know, the overhead doors and that kind of stuff, which is stupid, you know, why not, you know, why not leave your checkbook laying out or, you know, <laughs> key to your, you know, safety deposit box. So I thought it was stupid of them. So I had to talk, the hospital administrator wanted me to talk to him, and, you know, and, you know, I, so he didn't really tell me what to say, I just, you know, I said, you know, and we're, you know, ready for this changeover, but there's a problem, you know. We're not accepting it uh, until, you know, you give us, we need some keys for this. There's no keys. And uh, the guy I was talking to, you know, he wasn't very, uh, I mean, we're talking about millions of dollars. Now, maybe they got a small amount of money already or something, but he didn't seem like he... <laughs> so... Uh, I said, you know, we use Kenton Brothers Lock Company here, and they do all our key work and everything. And uh, I said, but they don't know anything about these keys. You know, they don't know how to. They don't know anything about them. And he, the guy, said, uh, the keys are. Um, I think he said in Holland or Switzerland. That's where their key, the locks and the keys are made, and you can't get them here. You have to get them for whatever. So anyway, I made my little talk, and then I left, and I guess before long, you know, the changeover got, you know, got made. And then uh, the director of security was still off, so I, I had to, uh, and I'm not too smart, but I, I did it correctly, you know, I, I set up an accounting system for the parking lot attendants who had to collect, you know, money for the parking and that kind of stuff. And uh, I made up the form so they could, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of their shift or whatever, they would account for that kind of stuff. And I did everything okay. I don't know why I uh, did a good job, but I did. Um, but the director of security had told me that uh, uh, patients had to pay, like if you were a patient in the hospital for a week or something or whatever, when you left you had to pay. And I said, I don't think that's a good idea. So anyway, I drew up the procedures, you know. And so when he came back, I had it where you know, the parking lot attendants, you know, did not take money from some, even if they were there for a day, if they came in for an x-ray or something, you know, no, you don't, don't you know. If you know, you know, don't charge them. And uh, definitely not patients. And uh, 
when the director of security came back, he said, oh, Jim, you did a good job, except I want the people to pay. And I said, I don't think they should pay. And uh, so he drew up a, a, a thing, a policy that said that a patient or somebody who came in to have a chest x-ray or if you were a patient in the hospital for a week or whatever, you had to go to, and I forget where it was, to get you know a thing where you didn't have to pay. And I told the parking lot attendant, no, I don't tell the, you know, just open the gate for them. Then another thing I did, which the director of security said, you know, not to do, I didn't ask him, I just told him my park, I had seven parking lot attendants that I was in charge of, in addition to the security officers. And I told them, you know, at like the days, you know, at the day shift, when the nurses and other employees start leaving, just, and they had a booth right there where they could see and they could control the gate, you know. I said, when the employees are leaving, you know, just raise up the gate. Now, is there going to be somebody that, you know, gets in there that was a visitor, you know, lined up? Of course, all the employees had stickers. Well, they had stickers on Well, that's another story. And they had to have an employee sticker on their car. But I said, just raise the gate up and let them go. And then, you know, when, that's, when the employees are not coming out anymore, you know, then you put the gate down and, and see, they could use a card if they were an employee. So it wasn't a matter of, of an employee not being able to get out. They had a card, and they could put it in, and that would raise the gate up for them. But that would take a long time, each person driving up, putting the card in, and that type of stuff. So uh, the nurses, uh, because of parking being such a problem, but this new, new garage, ooh, that took care of, you know, uh, for a while, you know, lots of parking and stuff. People still can... People still complained about parking and stuff, but still. Um, but the nurses got together. They were going to administration. We got good support from, from the assistant administrator of the hospital. He was in charge of various departments, including security, and he was very supportive. And uh, there was uh, doctors, too, sometimes would go and complain about parking you know, and security. And nurses were going all the time and complaining. I don't really know, know why, you know, about, uh, you know, parking. Um, so, and so we, they, we were supported. So the nurses got together, not every one of them, but a lot of them. They scraped off the uh, employee parking thing off their bumper. And so the parking lot attendants, a gym, the nurses uh, have, a whole bunch of them, have taken off their, uh, this employee sticker on the car. And I said, okay, I said, uh, I'll be out here when it's time for the employees to go home, and I'll take care of it. So I went out, and I told them, when I went out there, I told the you know, parking lot attendant that was in the booth and whatever, I said, don't raise up the gate. I know it's time for the employees to go home, leave the gate down, and I will signal you when to raise up the gate. And so then I went over, and em employees started honking their horn because they were used, you know, they didn't know I was the one. <laughs> that, uh, and so I go over and I said, uh, you know, she said, I, I forget, it's been a years, but you know, well, I'm an employee, and I said, yes. Where's your sticker? It looks like it's been scraped off. And I said, I tell you what, if you don't have a sticker on your car, I said, I'll give you till tomorrow when you come in, you go to security and you'll get a new sticker. But if you don't have a sticker on your car, uh, one, you're not supposed to park in there, but number two, when you go to leave, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to leave. I mean, I, I didn't actually say that. I, I couldn't, you know, <laughs> I couldn't or, kidnap somebody or hold them against her, but I forget what I said. And then, of course, uh, she goes on through. The next one, you know, maybe had a sticker and goes on through. The next one didn't have a sticker or whatever. No sticker. And I'm still there, of course. And then there's a guy or there's a guy, you know, several cars back, and he's honking his horn. And so I talked to the, the nurse or whatever and told her, you know, hey, 
you need to go to security and get a sticker and put it on your car. And this will take care of the, this problem and you can also park in the parking garage, you know. And then of course the parking lot attendant was over there ready to, you know, and I, no, you know, keep the gate down. And then I slowly, as slowly as I could walk, I slowly walked up to, you know, the guy that's honking his horn, the employee or whatever, and I said, uh, is there some type of, do you have some type of a problem? Is there an emergency? No, I want to go home. Why don't you guys have the gate raised up or whatever? And I said, well, the problem is one of your fellow employees has scraped off the sticker as a protest on their car. And I just explained to her, and I'm explaining to you now, I don't know if he had, he probably had his sticker on his car. And I, and I said, so that's what I was taking care of. And uh, I said, I explained it to her, and I'll be letting her leave here in a little bit. And then you can get out. And then I slowly walked back and then signaled for the parking lot attendant to raise the gate up, you know. The nurses, all all of them, you know, uh, decided to drop their protest. So, anyway, uh, 36 minutes of great stories, right? Uh, thank you very much for watching. By the way, I can hear barely the music, so I don't think I'm going to get a copyright yet. <laughs>